You're listening to Mark of the Maker. And this is episode 17. Hey everybody, you're listening to Mark of the Maker. Uh, I'm Mark Steiner and this is episode 17 of Mark of the Maker podcast. And this time we're going to talk about a couple of different topics. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking about ethnic knives, knives that come out of specific cultures and uh, were developed for a bunch of reasons. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and why we're talking about it. And then a little bit later in the show, we're going to talk about the USN gathering, uh, gathering 10. It's hard to believe it's 10 year anniversary of that show in Vegas, but it's a big show. It's got some unique things about it compared to other shows. So we'll get into that a little bit in sort of the second half of our episode. And uh, let's check in with everybody, make sure we got everybody here. Mr. Tom Kreiner, are you here? I'm here. And excited. Yeah. I've, uh, you know, show prep, I've got a little bit of caffeine on board. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael Birch, are you with us? I am here. And tired, it sounds like. Yeah, that's oh, the yeah. voice of enthusiasm. Hell yeah. I worn out. That's the voice of, damn, I can't believe that show is coming up. When? Uh-huh. <laughs> Just look at your apocalypse clock. <laughs> <laughs> it oh, don't shit. take minds to do that math. Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and clearly we have Mr. Sean Kendrick with us as well. Oh, yeah. I'm here and I'm ready to rock because I ain't got no show I'm going to. Yeah. <clears throat> Good time. All right. So, uh, yeah, Ethnic Knives is the topic, which has kind of an interesting name. And uh, Sean took a shot at putting together a little intro on this topic. We're going to do it a little bit like we did the Five Knives episode where we sort of go around the table and each person takes a turn. I'm going to, along with the listeners, hopefully in some cases here, I'm going to learn a few things along the way myself. Um, Some of these knives I'm familiar with and there are several that I am not. Anyway, Sean, you want to give us the description and why we're talking about ethnic knives as a topic? All right. To get us rolling, let's start with a quick definition of ethnic cutlery. For our purposes, ethnic cutlery is a bladed implement that is strongly associated with a certain ethnicity, culture, or geographic region. Now, why are we talking about ethnic cutlery? Well, because of the wealth of inspiration that is readily available from the designs. They are almost without exception time-tested performers. They're proven to work. Many of these pieces have rich and historically reaching backstories. I had a fantastic time researching my picks, and I'd recommend the exercise to any of our listeners. Just pick an ethnic or historical design and find out everything you can about it. The reach of some of the designs is surprising. So, with all that said, let's get to our first pick. Tom, what was your first pick, bud? Uh... Really looking forward to this too, Sean. Uh, this is, you know, uh, a lot of these have kind of backstories and a lot of a lot of importance to to me, anyways. The ones I chose. Um, the first one I chose is the Puko. Uh, pretty much a easy pick for me. Um, I can remember way back in the day uh, looking at Kellum knives and like Ragweed Forge, and uh, I can remember early on thinking that uh, they were just beautiful. I love the simplicity of it. And, uh, so the Puko knives are the knives of, uh, the Nordic knives, you know, uh, Sweden, Norway, Finland. And these were just the, the, the work knives of the people there. If you look at them, they're really pretty simple, you know, usually a four inch or less blade. Um, I love the fact that they use like local materials in the handle, uh, a lot of, uh, like curly birch or, uh, birch bark or antler, um, and uh, if you look at the knives, they're really, they're, they're elegant in their simplicity. But what, what I think is really cool is the, the sheaths that they do for these knives. So the knives are straightforward, all, all just form follows function. But the sheaths that, you know, they're wood lined and they're leather. Some of them have antler and they're, you know, just beautifully worked and carved. And, uh, you know, of course you've got some simple ones, but uh, most of them, uh, you can find some pretty elegant knives or sheaths for the knives. Um, you know, with the, the bushcraft uh, resurgence, the Puko knives have really come back. And I think probably the the most common 
that you'll see in the bushcraft circles is the Mora knives. Uh, there it's a sweet Sweden, uh, Swedish brand. Uh, and, it, and I'm sure you've seen them. It's Scandi grind with the, you know, simple carbon steels and, uh, the red, you know, barrel shaped handles. Uh, you know, early on when I looked at them, I, I didn't like the Pucos because of the fact that they didn't have a guard. Um, and I didn't really appreciate the Scandi grind either back in the day. And then, you know, everybody raved about them. So I bought a couple of the little Mora knives and, uh, I've probably got 20 or 30 of them now. Uh, they carve like nothing else and they're just, they're just a really functional knife. And you know, the fact that there's not a guard, these are not designed really for stabbing or any of that. So it allows you to really choke up and get close to the, close to the work, you know, um, there's no guard to get in the way when you're carving and doing whatever you need to do. What about you guys? Uh, what are your thoughts on Puko knives? I think they're pretty awesome. Uh, now, I especially like the Mora knives. They're great. They used guy. to keep bins of them at the hardware store I used to go to gun shop at. And yeah, I always enjoyed looking at them. I've owned a few, and they're just a straightforward, good using knife. They're a quality tool. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's something, like you said, about the, the functionality of it that makes it pretty awesome. A really cool knife. Just the fact that it just works. You know, there's something to be said about that, even in the design of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Historically, you know, these were part of their daily wear. Um, it was, you know, that's that's another thing that I really liked about it. You know, the the sheath was for the dress and it, you, you kind of showed off with it. But this was a common part of everybody's daily wear. You know, recently knife laws have have changed some of that, although from what I understand, they don't really enforce them. But, uh, yeah, uh, crazy cool. I think that's, it, it's kind of like, uh, considered sort of a peasant's knife, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was a working man's knife. Well, it just, it's interesting that a lot of those, I think what we may come across more than a few of those in our, our list tonight, just cause they were, they became so popular cause they worked, you know, you kind of, you whittled down everything that wasn't necessary in a knife and came with the bare bones. Yeah. I was looking at something online here that talks about how um, carrying a knife in Finland is prohibited, but even though carrying a puko is illegal, it's not vigorously enforced like it, yeah. because it's such a part of the culture and and a work tool kind of thing that it's not uncommon to see people with them carrying them openly. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I'd I'd, I'd really recommend people to check out Kellum knives and like Ragweed Forge and 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 more knives if you're not familiar. Very cool. I think this is probably true in, in lots of cultures. Um, one of the other things it says on here is uh, receiving a puko as a gift is considered an honor. The idea being that the presenter is giving the recipient a tool, which is essential for both woodworking and preparing food. So, uh, you know, like I care about you. Here's a tool that you can use to take care of yourself or your family. That's pretty, pretty cool sentiment. Yeah, a hundred percent. The other cool thing is, you know, kind of what you guys are talking about. The beauty of the, of a knife is that it's a, it's a tool and it can be used as a weapon. So like in world war two, they just like lengthened out the blade on some of these. And that's what they carried was like six inch Pucos. Hmm. Good stuff. Very nice. Great first choice, Tom. Thanks. Bravo. Sean, I got you up next. You want to take your first shot? Yeah, I'm going to talk about the Kinjal Dagger. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a dagger from the Caucasus Mountain region. That's the mountain region in Russia that separates the Baltic and the Black Sea. A really, really culturally diverse area. Uh, you have the Russian influence on one side of the mountain, and then you have the Turk, Armenian, and sort of Middle Eastern influence on the other side of the mountain. So you have a real ethnic boiling pot in this area, and you can see it in the Kinjal. Uh, it has sort of a Turkish sort of handle, but then a very European blade, probably inspired by the Roman gladius. And you have basically two kinds of kindle. You have a comma and the kindle. The kindle is less decorated and more utilitarian than the comma, spelled Q-A-M-A. -A. Generally, the comma style has uh, enamel, uh, silver work, very 
ornate detail work on it. And uh, it's just a fantastic dagger. And some of them are actually short swords and a very good looking knife, you know, a kind of gladius style blade with a not centered fullers. You generally have at least two fullers, one of each on each side of the center of the blade. And then uh, I'm trying to think of what to call the handle. Uh, it's not quite a dog bone style handle, but it definitely encompasses the hand with a large butt on the end. It's like almost like your gladi or gladius type handle, your Roman handle, if, as a way of thinking of it. Yeah, with a little bit. It's generally just kind of squashed that. flat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> and once again, I mean, you you can see the Roman influence on the piece, but then with a lot of the fancier ones, and once again with the way they treat the handle, there's a hard Middle Eastern influence there too. Yeah, that's a very cool pick right there. Oh, man, I had a great time reading up on the Caucasus mountain range. Really, really interesting little part of our world there. Yeah, a lot of fighting went on up there. Yeah, no shit, man. I think that went into this design. I mean, if you look at it, you know this is not like you're not going to cut bread with this. Oh, man, it looks like martial blade wear, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know about you guys, but uh, a lot of these knives, the ethnic knives, I don't know if if you remember the, uh, um, what was it, Atlanta Cutlery? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. The catalogs, they had the best ethnic stuff in there. I, I actually bought one of these from them. Pretty fun. Buffalo horn handle. The Atlanta Cutlery actually made me, exposed me to a lot of those designs just because they actually had like a descriptor that talked about where these things come from or came from. You know, it was, yeah. it was awesome. It wasn't just that you had like a, sort of museum replica type thing, which is another company did it, but it, you actually had the information. Those are the same so you, company. Oh, are they really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. They're the same. Was museum replica, the company that sold all the basically blank firing guns. I think so. I know that they uh, sold Dixie, some Dixie Gunworks did a bunch of that sort of stuff too. the kits. Yeah. I think, was it Hank? Uh, what was the guys, the reenactor? He owned both of them. I mean, they were they were owned by the same co people. I love those catalogs because, like you said, Michael, they they and they're st and I still have gotten them. I mean, my kids, I've ordered some stuff for my kids out of there. They're still around, but uh, yeah, I love this choice. And and the point of of this whole episode was sort of the influence. It and you can see if you look at some of these old styles and these old pieces you'll you'll see them you'll start seeing those lines in like modern knives now um and there's a reason for it you know these are are great designs like this one there's a there's a knife i can't remember who made it in the first points of interest book that very much reminds me of the style it's not it isn't that knife but it's that style you can see the same lines in it and it's just it's an art knife you know in the in the book and i'll post that up after uh, after this releases now on the on the handle of that knife, it looks like it's fairly common to have like big rounded pins. I assume they're pins or maybe screws, but um, that I assume is it a hidden tang thing usually? Yeah, yeah. And those are just attaching pins or screws that hold the hold the handles on. Probably, it almost looks like a design feature because yeah, you see a it lot on of lots decorative of decorative design work on it though. Very cool. Man, one of the coolest I've seen, a uh, knife maker named Zaza Revishili. Man, I hope he, I'm pronouncing his name right. If I'm not, I'm sorry. You're a fantastic knife maker. And, uh, man, I saw one he did that was just laid out in gold filigree or silver filigree and Damascus. And the sheath matched the handle and the blade was immaculate. And I was like, yeah, that is phenomenal. That's pretty nice. Yeah, and it's also the official knife of the Georgian Republic. Huh. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I didn't know we could do official knives. Hey, man, it's Georgia. They do whatever the fuck they want. <laughs> yeah. That's very interesting. Huh. It looks like there is a, uh, a ballistic missile with the same name, probably based on the idea of the shape. Uh, now, that name actually gets used a lot. Uh, let's see. I think there is a fighter spacecraft in Dune they call a Kindle. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I believe in mod the newest modern warfare, 
the uh, space fighters they use are referred to as Kenjal class ships. Interesting. You know, I almost went with the uh, Jambia, and we would have been real close, except the Jambia has got that real, you know, curve to it. The super. And they have similar handles, and I, yeah, now I think handles. the Jambia handle is where they took some of the cues for the uh, cop or not Copus, damn it, the Kenjal handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but same, same, but it just superbly curved. Mm -hmm. Oh, now, man, I thought about the Jambia, too, because I love that knife. That is a dramatic-looking piece. There is a ton of cultural significance to it, but I thought it was too obvious. I couldn't think of, you know, you don't see a ton of modern interpretations of it. You know, you well, no, you'll look see, at the blade. Who wants to grind that motherfucker? No, I mean, really? nobody, nobody wants to do that, but it's such. it was such a decorative-type knife, and it was a gorgeous design. And the sheaths gorgeous themselves design. were were a... A kind of their own special, you know, or almost went with it, but didn't. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, they always complimented the handle. I mean, mm -hmm. one way or the other. They were how, as much a you even, part of costume as a weapon. How would you even do that blade without forging? I mean, I don't that, know. that rib that goes down the middle on those. I mean, I, I don't yeah. know. You know, that, that Holy, structural yeah. T or, you know, kind of. Yeah, it's got like a. I beam. Yeah, yeah the basically. I beam centerpiece, basically. <laughs> that, yeah, that probably answers the questions of why I couldn't come up with the, any modern <laughs> versions. Yeah. I know Mick Strider did a modern interpretation. Oh, really? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, man, I can't remember what... It was It was foreign order for some nation. That's pretty cool. I remember seeing it, and it was a very cool interpretation in, you know, blasted stainless and G10. Very cool. Oh, wow. I have to look that one up then. Awesome. Now, did you spell that out for folks that want to check it out later? Dude, I have found at least five different <laughs> spellings for it. The way I'm going to lay it out is K-I-N-J-A-L. You also get a pretty good return on your search if you type in K-I-N-D-J-A-L. Okay. I see another spelling with a Z, K-I-N-Z-H-A-L. That sounds like more like a phonetic translated a version. Kinsal. Yeah, I think that's from a different area of the Caucasus, actually. Ah, uh, okay. A lot of it is, you know, you go two states over and it's the same blade, but a different name. Ah, uh, okay. And it's always cool to toss a Z at the end. It makes it extreme. The 90s mm -hmm. taught us that. Yeah. Right. That's the Mountain Dew version. <laughs> <laughs> Right. All right, Michael, you want to take your first swing at this thing? Will do. Uh, this one has a couple of pronunciations, the Higa no Kami. Um, I've, I've heard it, Higo no Kami, which I don't really like too well, but it's another way of saying it. <laughs> a lot of people will also just call it a, H a Higo. Higo knife. It's, a, it's basically a Japanese friction folder. Um with sort of a cleaverish type blade. Um, I'm sure you guys have, have seen this before and know what I'm talking Ironically, about. Ironically, I bought two of them last week. I know. <laughs> what? <laughs> Seriously, that's crazy. You. <laughs> that's funny. Well, the idea behind this was there was, you know, sword production was very big in Japan. And, but we came across this little, uh, decline of of the demand for swords when there was like these reforms made um so these smiths had nothing to do nothing to make so these things first appeared around like night like late 1800s like 1896 or something like that and it was like basically a, a sort of basic knife you know it was basically folded brass uh a simple steel to them sort of inside it. But the unique part was the sort of flattened top area where the friction folder comes in usually just has a tab. This had sort of a T that came out and hit against the, uh, the folded um, handle. Um, and that's actually, it's actually a trademarked um, name that was only allowed to be done by this uh, Miko um, guild. But then it kind of it stayed around to like the 1960s, and then I guess they had sort of a some knife laws um, 
sort of the same thing that happened to the samurai swords and stuff like that. Uh, somebody got hurt with one and they kind of, they really went down on their, their knife laws and it kind of went away for a while, but we've seen sort of this resurgence in it coming back now. Um, as far as Smith's kind of tackling it, um, you know, blacksmiths and, and knife makers have been kind of hitting it again, which made me want to revisit that knife. I think it's just, it's simple yet cool. You know, it usually had a, a very thin ground, um, white steel and a simple handle. Blade HQ has a really good selection of these. And what, what drew me to purchasing a couple was they've got some, the price is really low and it's a rustic, like peasant type knife almost. Mm-hmm. And the steels are really nice and the prices are low. So I, I just got a couple to play around with. Yeah, they're pretty neat. And it, it actually translates to the Lord of the Higo, which is just, it's it's very interesting. You know, big old name, but it was made for a, a tool for the common folk. I'm surprised it's not older than it is. I mean, in the great scheme of things, 1890s ain't that old. No, it's it's basically a kind of a modern knife. Especially in Asian culture, right? Oh, Japanese yeah. culture. 1896 is like yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, there was a yeah, really a big, good choice. Really, really good choice. But it's a basic knife, but an interesting one. And like I say, you just you see them more now nowadays. Interesting. There's like in, you know, if you think about the parallel of that situation where it's basically uh arms manufacturing, right? That gets that goes away, in this mm-hmm. case due to some changes or whether it's a war ending or whatever, and then those same machines and equipment and people and trades, they got to do something, right? So right. in this case, they kind of switch gears and this is one of the things they start doing. That's interesting. Yeah. They, uh, they say nature abhors a, a void or a vacuum. Vacuum. Yeah. Very good. Nice job, Michael. I told Michael I was going to tease him about his pronunciation, but he did a fine job. Oh yeah. I, I, I just don't like the Higo no cami. It sounds like a, I don't like that pronunciation. And I'm, I'm that's sure a, that's a Missouri version. And maybe that's just how I say it in my head. That makes it sound so bad. Uh, it's definitely the version you say in your head. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stick with Higo. Higo. There you go. All right. Now that I paid my penance for being mean to Birch last week, we're even. <laughs> Asshole. That's what you think. <laughs> yeah. It ain't even until he says you're even. Ah. Uh, mm-hmm. Clearly, it's not. Okay, Tom, you want to take your second shot at uh, Ethnic Knife? Sure. Uh, so for my second choice, I, I chose one that uh, uh, I kind of like the story. Uh, that's the reason I chose it. And the knives are super cool, too. Um, it's the Kirpan. So I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's the Ceremonial Dagger of the Sikhs. Okay, I know that. I didn't know that's what it was called. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, so they're they're upswept too. They have that real kind of upswept blade, very Persiany, um, you know, from India. Um, and what I think is cool is that this is one of their. If you're a, a baptized Sikh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, this is one of the five articles of faith that they must wear. I mean, this isn't optional. It's like you got to wear this all the time. Uh, really. Yeah, so that's kind of kind of interesting, you know. It's the the saying is, or the, or when I looked it up, it said that uh, you know it must be worn at all times so that the Sikh may defend the needy, um, those that are oppressed, to defend the righteous, and the and defend freedom of expression, and to protect themselves. Although they must not attack first. Huh? Yeah, check that out. I like that. Pretty neat which makes it super controversial. So uh, right. part, part of the reason I like it, you know, um, because, you know, it's in, in like, I think it was in New York or wherever, but yeah, there's a lot of controversy around this because they're allowing this to be worn into high schools and pretty much uh, you can wear it almost everywhere. It seems like, except for like TSA on airplanes and stuff, it has to go in your checked baggage. But, uh, uh, yeah, you could, you could wear this because it's a part of your religious expression. You could wear one of these to 
high school or most buildings huh. uh, in some of the big cities, whereas, you know, no tolerance, you get kicked out if you got a butter knife in your lunch. So it, is there any utilitarian use at all, or is it basically ceremonial or basically? It's, it's a ceremonial defensive knife. Okay. So, I mean, it, it has I mean, a lot of a Jambia look to the blade. It does. It's it does, not quite right? as an aggressive upsweep and then a definite Turk inspired handle. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. It, it definitely has that, uh, Eastern feel. Very, uh, you know, you, you can find pictures of these made out of like wood steel and, uh, pretty neat stuff. This goes back quite a ways. So really, oh. really neat piece. And I love, like I said, I love the. I guess the theology of it, maybe, I don't know. Uh, kind of cool. So for, you know, we have a lot of, uh, <laughs> oftentimes you can hear Tom Googling himself in the background. And, uh, <laughs> we know we have a lot of listeners that do the same when they listen to the show. So the spelling is K I R P like Paul a N. And, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting shape. What is there any information in your research Tom, about why it has that big sweep at the end? I, I didn't find any reason why. Um, I know that a lot of them, some of them are very pronounced, and the sheath um, is even more pronounced than than the knife. And I think the reason for the sheath being more pronounced the, than the knife is that these were often worn in like a turban, or not a turban, a uh, uh, sash. And so that <laughs> okay. helps it stay in the sash when you draw it. Uh, it catches at the bottom of the sash on the J at the bottom of the sheath. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Dude, that makes so much sense. Sort of like the Jambia. Yeah, exactly the same. There's got to be a reason. I mean, it, it'd be interesting to find out what that design was originally for. Man, I would like to know how all of these upswept points started popping up in this area of the world. It's right. very well, consistent. Well, I mean, what happens when you forge a knife? I'm not super swift at forging, but doesn't the tip start coming up as you thin it down? Well, it does, but it's also, uh, you know, you, you make it go down first and then that way you compensate for the tip up. Right. Now I can tell you like for a little bit of like the old school military knife history stuff, a lot of our swords and, and short sword stuff started out as sort of like your gladius. It was a, uh, a very, uh, foot soldier type of, of knife, um, kind of enclosed, son of a shorter sword. But when we came to having cavalries, that's when things started changing to your more saber style. And that's your upswept um, blade because it was a slashing down from a horse. Swing. Yeah. So you needed this upswept blade. And I wonder if some of that came into, turned into a smaller defensive version of that. I don't know. I'm, I'm just also- wondering. I've also seen some uh, research where, you know, if you have a, a narrow blade and you stab, it makes a narrow hole. Whereas if you have this upswept blade, when you stab, it makes a much bigger hole in people. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I thought about uh, when I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, you know, if you had it in like a reverse grip, it would be almost like where you could hook it into something, trap. right? Yeah, you could trap yeah, it. Yeah. In a trap motion. Now, what's interesting is I pulled up a website that talks about... Uh, the website is Sikh Sangat, the voice of Sikh since 2001. And it actually says the shape is of the number one um, in their script, in oh. their uh, oh. written language. Huh. Hmm. So it sounds like maybe there's a uh, ceremonial reason for the shape as well. And the other thing that's interesting in the entry is it says that the that they're curved and have a single cutting edge that may be either blunt or sharp. Yeah, for the ceremonial. Right. Maybe uh, I wonder if AJ will be at uh, at the gathering. Yeah, he'll be there. Yeah, maybe we can talk to him about it. He, I'm sure. I, I thought about trying to reach out to him, and I, I'll be honest, I just ran out of time getting ready for the show. Yeah, good if pick. You pull up the uh, if you pull up the alphabet that shows the letters. The number one has sort of a. It almost looks like a nine. And then the base of the nine, instead of coming straight down, has a hook at the bottom. Huh. Hmm. So, yeah, very interesting. Really, really crazy stuff. I love, I just, you know, a lot of these we're not as familiar with, and there's a lot of pretty interesting history. 
Oh, very. I mean, yeah. real the one everything I looked at, you could spend most of a day researching and just scratch the surface. Yeah, the history of them, that the, the deep history of these knives are just. I don't know. Like I said, you can get buried in it, but it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, then you start looking for genetic markers and descendants and, oh, this came from mm. this. Yeah. That's when yeah. things get really interesting. Very cool. Good pick. Thanks. Sean, you want to take a shot at your next pick? Yeah, I'm going to change up my order a little bit since Michael was talking about sabers. Uh, my next pick is the killage. And the oh, killage yeah. is... a. Uh, it's a Turk cavalry saber. The word killage actually just means sword. Uh, it evolved from Turco-Mongol horse sabers. The Seljuk rulers actually referred to themselves as the Kilij Aslan, or sword lines. And uh, it had a large influence on so many blades in the Middle East. Uh, the Shamshir and the Scimitar are direct descendants of it. And what the killage is, it is... The first of the really curvy cavalry sabers. Up until the killage came along, most of your cavalry sabers were pretty well straight, you know, daggery shaped, gladius shaped kind of blades. And along the way, somebody f figured out that, hey, this guy with this big swoopy curve and extra weight out toward the tip, it does bad, bad shit to people when you're on a horse and ride by them. And it has influenced most of the modern cavalry sabers we're familiar with. It's influenced so much so that the modern marine dress saber is a direct descendant of the killage. The marine dress saber was a take on the Mameluke sword. The Mameluke sword is a direct descendant of the killage. And the way that came about is you had British officers who started picking up the Mameluke sword when they were in Africa and Egypt, because that was the cavalry saber of the time, and it worked extraordinarily well, better than the European sabers. So you had European officers carrying the Mameluke sword. Well, I believe it was at the Battle of Barbary in the early 1800s, the U.S. Marines defeated the British, and several of the commanding officers were presented with Mameluke swords. The Mameluke sword, everybody liked it. It stuck, and it eventually evolved into the modern dress saber that the Marines wear today. Nice. Hell yeah. yeah. I thought that was an interesting little tidbit. And the fact that you can follow this back, let's see, it started evolving into the Mameluke sword about the 18th century, and it had been around several hundred years before that. Huh. Very cool. So is the, the thing's got a hell of a sweep to it. Yes, it does. And then it has that fat front end, which is called a Yalman. Okay. And that goes back to the weight bias thing that you were talking about. Mm hmm Man, I mean, if you're on a horse and you have that off at your side, you basically have a huge mowing blade you're riding at people with. So the idea is that as you... So you're going to... There's an impact of the blade, but if the blade was straight, it would basically hit the opponent or whatever it is you're trying to chop and... There's not you the, would have to like want to pull it out of your hand as you go by or something. Whereas this, as exactly. you're going by, that sweep yeah. allows the blade to stay in contact and just keep on cutting. Is that the idea? That is exactly the idea. Interesting. And then if you're putting extra swing behind it, the yalman or fat forward end gives you more, you know, kinetic energy behind your swing. It just works on a few levels and it works really fucking well. It was actually the preferred cavalry arm of Vlad Tepish, or Dracula, as some will know. <laughs> nice. The Impaler. Damn straight. He knew how to take care of folks who fucked with him. So the, the cool thing about it also is if you stab somebody with that, it cuts a huge hole through someone. I mean, that tip to the, that that's like a six inch wide belly on some of those. Right. Oh, or, yeah. That's, that's a good way to lose your sword when you're on horseback, though. I mean, the horse, you know, once we started riding horses, it changed the way our, our weapons were made. Sure. They started making, you know, riding horses or going larger horses back in like 500 BC or 400 BC or something to start riding and into, into war. Pretty crazy. I would love to see like a timeline for when this sword came, started coming about and when the stirrup actually started being used for cavalry. Yeah, that's a very yeah. interesting point, because with the way this is used, you would have to be mounted on your horse very securely. Right. Mm -hmm. Imagine hitting something with that thing at full of gallop. Yeah. Oh, you could cleave someone in two if you knew what you were doing. I have no doubt of that. 
I don't I don't know about you guys, but I've got a, a book on Woot's Steel, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's got I don't know how many of these in there, and they're just absolutely beautiful. So for the kids at home that want to uh, look this up, Killage, K-I-L-I-J. So uh, Turkish translation is sword, although the root verb comes from something that looks like instrument for killing. And that's certainly a theme in the, uh, in the knife world, right? The overall knife history kind of side of things. Yeah. But this is certainly looks like a very effective example. Mm-hmm. The the whole history of sabers is like a, a rabbit hole you could spend days in. Oh. oh yeah, man. It is immense. Yeah. And quite a bit of fun. And now here's a little pop cultural reference for you. On Game of Thrones, the Dornish Cavalry, Carrie Killage. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yes, sir. Huh. Look at that. It's it's crazy. I have not watched Game of Thrones. You are missing out, buddy. I've I've read all the books. I've literally read all the books four times. Oh, well, then you're good. It, yeah. But it's so it's enough different that when I watched started watching it, it like was messing with me a little bit. So I could see that, especially if you're really invested in the books. So you started and just didn't didn't like where it was going or didn't. Yeah, I, just, I bought season one. I own it. And I watched some of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean this uh, like like you said, Sean, huge. Interesting, very long running history and pretty solid ability to connect the dots. That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. I mean, what I gave was just the most base, base cliff notes. Yeah, interesting. Ottoman Turks to the Egyptians to the Ottoman invasion of the Balkans, which brought it into European armies through the Greeks, Russians, Ukrainians, Poles, Slavs, Hungarians, <laughs> and then eventually all the way to the West. Very interesting. Mm hmm. Speaks to it the effectiveness of its design, I guess, right? Yes. Nothing succeeds like success. Well, man, from what I was looking in my research, it seemed like every culture that came into contact with this in combat pretty much switched over to it after a couple encounters. Right, right. Nice choice. Love it. Thank you. All right, Michael, I think uh, I think you're up for your number two. Well, I'm going to switch my order now because of what he went with. Well, Wild card. Uh-huh. I am also going auto man. I'm going with the Yatagan. Now to this one, you, you guys know what this one is? I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. The It's a long reverse sort of knife. It's not like your, your saber, typical saber. It has a downward... Um, Bowed type it's of almost blade. recurved. Yeah, yeah. It, it very much recurved, almost like a, a stretched out recurved buoy. But it yeah. had a very interesting handle that almost split outward. Um, mm-hmm. As far as there's an art knife somewhere with a handle very similar to this. It's also yeah. In one of the points of interest, the guy did yeah. one that was very. I had kind of a, a loveless ivory. type blade, but it had an ivory that split out the same way. Basically, it widens out in your hand. You know, it's sort of a don't slip out of your hand, but not as a thickness as in width, as in filling your hand. Sort of like putting a, you know, trying to get a, a triangle shape something out of your hand. Uh, it's just it, very interesting shape. Um, you can see some of the modern influences and in some of the machetes and type of uh, bush knives made these days. Yeah. Um, it's a It's a very... Beautiful knife. The lines are gorgeous on it. Um, to me, it's just, I don't know. It's another one of those, you know, sort of Ottoman knives that was made for kicking ass. And the interesting thing about it is when the, the French started doing, uh, making bayonets, one of the earliest bayonets was called the Yadigan bayonet, which they started in like 1840. And it was the same idea, a very swoop down type of, of blade and those became our the the French uh design bayonet for like fifty years or something like that. And it was based off those North African Yadigan swords. It's funny how the Yadigans moved around because it's a North African weapon, but you mm-hmm. find it heavily in Western Europe. I mean there there's a specific yeah. category of Balkan Yadagons. Yeah, and there's different spellings of it, you know, and yeah. It, yeah. When I when I think of Kinjal I think of Yadigan too. I think of them together. 
Yeah. Right. It, it, yeah, yeah. Very I much. See that. Yeah. You have your sword and then you have your belt knife. Mm hmm. But these were kind of longish, short swords. I mean, they very cool pieces. Oh, yeah. Very elegant looking blades. And it's one of those when I was uh, going back to Atlantic Cutlery. Um, <laughs> they used to have one in there that I was just like, shit, yeah, that is a badass looking knife. And that's the main reason I loved it, just because it looked cool when I was a kid. You know, and that kind of uh, fluid history of it. I wonder I wonder how big of an influence like Atlanta Cutlery and Museum Replicas had on for our generation, just out of curiosity. Enough that we probably made this podcast based on our love of these as a kid. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Dude, for it sure. Played a big part with me. I researched a lot of you know, just old types of historical knives just because of those damn catalogs. That's awesome. Yeah. So th- looks like maybe these were sometimes cut down from other other bigger swords, right? Mm-hmm. At least that's the info I'm seeing. Very interesting. Yeah, but it's a very cool shape. Yeah, the shape is gorgeous. Now, uh, a modern smith made a version that I actually think called it a Yeti game, but I can't think of his name. I'll come up with that uh, probably after the show's over. Right. What's the – so the, the handle shape is a retention thing? Like the idea that so that you could swing this thing and yeah. not lose grip on it. Is that the idea? Yeah. It's just, it's hard to explain that the width thing, you know, you think of width, you think of just a thick handle, you know, in modern knives, it's just kind of like a, a wine barrel, so to speak, thicker in the middle. But this was sort of a wedge that kind of stuck out. And I'm sure there's a bit of ceremonial reasoning behind it too, because there's a lot of ivory and bone. Mm-hmm. It kind of reminds me of the shape of like a barong or a, uh- like uh, uh, some of the Indonesian and Javanese. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Like a Moro sword. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very much. Yeah, and it's interesting how some of these shapes and, and blades and handles kind of jump all over continents and different cultures, you know, just probably because of, of war. You know, you see something that works yeah. well or you see something you're like, that looked like it worked like some bitch. I'm going to do that now. Yeah. Or you see what that did to Claude? Yeah, we need to get us some of that. <laughs> right? <laughs> you see that sword cut through Claude? Shit. And don't ask me where the name Claude come from. I got no fucking clue. <laughs> some poor Viking named Claude. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, another another piece that's in that Woots book. There's some Woots. Uh, you can find these with the Woots steel. I love all that Ottoman Empire type stuff uh, where they're thousand years ago or whatever they're building them out of the wood steel and stuff. Well, Ottoman Empire isn't, you know, th- that covered a lot of, a lot of ground yeah. at some points, the, the Balkans and then Caucasus and uh, just, yeah, very interesting uh, swords came out of there. Ethnicities. Mm-hmm. Very much. So spelling on this one for people that want to look it up is Y-A-T like in Tom, A-G like in Gary, A-N. There's another spelling, Y-A-T-A-G-H-A-N. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's kind of interesting if you look it up in Wikipedia, there's a pretty cool picture from um, from a museum that shows both that and a killage in the same picture. So you can kind of see them side by side. Differences in the handle shape are pretty pronounced. Hell yeah. They also have a painting below that that shows like one with like a uh, Ken Jaw, it looks like, in the other hand. It does look like that, doesn't it? Right? It's kind of cool. You see the little rib? Yeah. Huh. The little flute or whatever. Yeah. I mean, nice. like I said, to me, in my mind, these are all in that, you know, Russian, Turkish area, the Slavic area. The, they're all connected, you know, at, at, some, at some way. There, there's a line connecting these. Oh, and the Turks have had a huge influence on cutlery. I didn't understand how much until we started this. Oh, very much. Well, yeah. They, I mean, they like dominated the world for a while. Mm. The whole Ottoman Empire thing. Yeah, Turkish Blades covers a lot of these right here. That's a lot of different names for a lot of the same type of knives and places. Interesting. Good pick, man. Thanks, man. It, it's just I just love the look of it. All right. Tom, looks like you are up next, my man. So uh, my next my next pick uh, actually comes from kind of the same area. Um, comes from Tibet or ne- Nepal, actually. Um, but uh, I went with the kukri. Yeah. Classic. I hope somebody would grab it. I avoided yeah. it because I figured somebody got that quick. 
the big yeah. hitter. I, I mean, it's it's like this was once again Atlantic Cutlery Magazine. I actually bought one of these out of there. Still have it somewhere. Um, but I mean, this is a the kukri is a rabbit hole you can go down too. I mean, if you start <laughs> looking into it, it's everything from little bitty ones to big ones to fat, skinny, ceremonial. Um, it's it's kind of crazy. Um, the the thing I love about it, if you're not familiar with the kukri, it kind of uh, I, I imagine it came from the Greek kopus, uh, which was their kind of recurve sword um and basically these things are you know normally about what 12 to 14 inches of blade yeah yeah and it's got enough weight and with the curve in it man they are they put a lot of uh power into a cut it's a lopper yeah -hmm. you can literally cut people apart with this thing or trees or whatever what is very popular with the bushcraft uh community also um but yeah, uh, lots of cool stories about it. Um, here recently, it seems like uh, some of the um, Gurkhas got in trouble over in uh, the sandbox, I think. Uh, they were told to uh, kill somebody and bring, they were supposed to get pictures and, you know, proof and all that. And it seems like they came under fire and uh, one of the little dudes just chopped the dude's head off and they brought that back with them. Yep, I remember that. You guys remember that, right? I got in trouble for that. Now, I've got a buddy who works with a bunch of Gurkhas as a private contractor, and they take knives serious. I mean, really? Yeah, it's serious. A- yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, they're this this is their warrior class, and these guys have been basically mercenaries for the British Empire for a long time, right? Long time. Seems like I I remember a, a story where they had an uprising somewhere and they flew in a regiment of these guys and they uh, just had them line up and pull their knives out and everybody left. Yeah, really cool. Um, if you guys want to look at some of this stuff, Himalayan Imports is really one of the the bigger importers of them and they've got a ton of information on their site. I've got uh, two or three of their pieces and they're really they they do a good job and you know cool knife with a lot of history. Well, I remember first being drawn into the history of the Gurkhas before the, the knife. I thought the knife was cool, but it's kind of like the Kyber buoy and the, you know, and the Afghan yeah. pass sort of thing. The Gurkhas had a history that was just like, they were kicking ass sort of thing of Dude, very they're... few defending very much against a whole lot. You know, it just, when well, they're, they're not a very big people. No, uh, but they are tough as iron, and I wouldn't. It's like a honey badger, man. You yeah. don't want to corner one of those little guys. Yeah, the story oh, yeah. of them just Definitely. badass sons of bitches. But then the design of the kukri is just phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, and that that story about them in the sandbox where you know they had to bring back proof and they were supposed to take pictures, but brought the head. I mean, to me, that I mean that's what it's all about. When I think of a gurkha, that that sums it all up. I've actually got pictures on my hard drive of a line of goat heads from the Gurkhas having one of their Dashain ceremonies over in Afghanistan. Oh, the, the humongous ceremonial one? The ones for... No, man, I, don't, I didn't see the blade they used. It's just three goat heads on a table and my buddy standing with his Gurkhas behind it showing it off. Yeah. Huh. So they have a big ceremonial one and it has to do with uh, if they can take the head off of like a water buffalo with one mm-hmm. one chop. And if they can bring it off smoothly, uh, they get a good growing season or plenty of rain or something like that. And you can take out Colonel Kurtz while they're doing that. <laughs> Nobody gets the Apocalypse Now reference. Uh, really? Yeah. No. I was- <laughs> really? I mean, they actually killed that fucking yeah, water buffalo in, in, the, in movie, the movie. And you guys don't yeah. get the reference. I was trying not to laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> pretty, pretty funny. I was just, I made a note to myself. I've got to go back and watch Apocalypse Now. I was just, it. Popped up on my uh, Facebook a few days ago, and I watched part of it, and I was like, man, that's been a long time ago. Did you ever see the Redux? Yeah. No. Oh, oh yeah. I own it. Oh, it's phenomenal. But it's odd. It, it goes is. It goes strange. Stranger. It is very surreal. And that movie was already surreal a little bit, but it is huh. trippy, to say the least. Yeah. I'll check it out. All you listeners out there, you better go go see it if you haven't already. 
it's a little bit like when we did the Knives of the Movies episode and we went back and watched some movies that certainly I hadn't watched in many, 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 many years. Yep. And Apocalypse Now is like that for me where I watched it with my daughter. I think she had a film studies class and there was some stuff about Apocalypse Now. And so we, we watched that movie and it's like, yeah, I've seen that movie before, but sure, I'll watch it with you. And then I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> this is different than I remember or there's more to it than I remember. Or there maybe, I don't know being a different time in your life, it looks, feels, seems different, but yeah, definitely worth a revisit. <laughs> yeah. Cool. It's a, uh, it's still good. Still solid. Oh yeah. It holds up period. But the, and one of my favorite movies of all time for the record. I'm with you on that one. That and Conan, I saw one both at about the same time and they both had about the same effect. Got some emotional investment in that one. Mm hmm. But the Kukri, the Kukri design, uh, yeah. It's actually uh, seen kind of resurgence lately. You see a lot of uh, machetes and kukri esque type of of blades these days, and uh, I still think um, Jason Knight's version of it is the coolest. Pretty funny. I was just going to say that. Oh, I'm sorry. You I'm say it. Saying it. Pretend no, I didn't say. No. It. This was Tom speaking, by the way. <laughs> no, I was just gonna. I was gonna agree with you. He he does it the best. Oh, the the, the modern polar modern thing. interpretation. Mm, yeah, the one he just built uh, recently was pretty wicked. Pure sex, man. That thing is awesome. I'm glad you picked that. Someone had to. Thanks. Looks like they're a leaf spring knife. What's that? Looking on uh, at least the Wikipedia entry. Um, modern kukri blades are often forged from spring steel, sometimes collected from recycled truck suspension units. That yeah, makes sense. So interesting. Mm -hmm. Pretty pretty funny. When I lived in Thailand, um, we walked over to the village uh, close to us, and I had I had six knives made for me over there, and they they hammered them out of uh, truck springs. Yeah, yeah, probably pretty similar. The dude's anvil was a sledgehammer stuck in a stump. Nice. <laughs> Very. Yeah. What was his hammer? He had a little hammer, <laughs> so he had a little <laughs> hammer, and then he had a sledgehammer in there. And like for the handle, he he used another knife to chop most of it out, and then he used a broken piece of glass to scrape the wood until it got smooth. Damn! Wow! Wow! Pretty pretty impressive. I've got a couple Burmese swords and a couple of the Thai elephant knives. Huh? Pretty neat. Very cool. All right, Sean, you want to do your number three? Yeah, uh, my number three actually plays off of Michael and Tom's picks. It's the Greek Copus, and I'm going to lump yeah. the Falcata with it because I believe yeah. there's negligible difference between the Copus and the Falcata. Mm -hmm. Sweet. So, uh, Copus in Greek means to cut or to strike. The blade is believed to be of Etruscan origin originally, and they found examples as early as the 7th century B.C., and now uh, the big belly on the blade, which is, is a large recurved short sword, uh, the big belly is what makes it a copus. There's another type of large sword like that called a macara, which means chopper, but it doesn't have the recurve. And uh, the historian Xenophon, the military historian, recommended it exclusively almost for mounted combat at the time. And I believe, well, it's believed that the Yadigan is a direct descendant of it and the Kukri are a direct descendant of it. And if you look, you can see why. Yeah, very much. And just a, fan, a phenomenally good looking blade. Oh, it's sexy. Very sexy. Yeah, it yeah. is. I mean, it's a big dramatic recurve. Uh-huh. You're, you're lumping the Copus and the Falchetta together. What, I mean... I, what's the difference? I'm curious. Is, is Dude, there that's why I'm many? lumping them together. I cannot Not see much. really a difference to where you would differentiate one with the other or where a neophyte such as myself could differentiate one from the other. Wasn't that a regional thing? Yeah, that's that's how I've always felt. I didn't know if your research showed anything else. Man, I couldn't come up with any differences, and I was seeing it used almost interchangeably. Huh. I mean, they're good looking. They're yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Uh, generally, a, kind of a semi D guard handle. Usually, the handle completely encloses the knuckles. Although uh, that's not a rule, yeah. there are exceptions, but generally, it has that kind of enclosed handle. So, this is K O P I S. And so, we're kind of going back in time 
right? So this predates the, yeah. the other oh, ones yeah. that we just talked about By a bit. Yeah. It's a very, very early knife. And I also wonder. Yeah, yeah. you're talking what, bronze? Uh-huh. I think this is yeah. one of the coming right out of that bronze type of thing. And I think some of those actually yeah. were the Copas. I thought were coming out were actually in bronze, right? Yeah, definitely. I know I've seen antiquities that were bronze. Well, I wonder if some of those extremely early ones were, were born from utility. You know, before we went to war, we, we grew crops. We, we tried to um, do agriculture and, and, you know, became from nomadic to um, being villages and places. We stayed put. We started growing crops. We needed things to chop the crops. Recurves, you know, are are perfect for chopping your crops down. I mean, it's just a, a good chopping blade. And I wonder if some of these early um, blades that went to war came from pure agricultural utility. And, and that's just oh, pure. I think so. That's pure speculation on, on my, my part. Kind of well, same I'll idea. I'll speculate with you on that. Because same I mean, idea. a lot of the time war hits and you're not prepared. Yeah. War comes after you have something worth taking. Um, and that's just kind of yeah. how sad history is. But it's kind of like the same as the pruning knife turned into the cutting knife, you know, the, the very aggressive, right. same kind of idea. Yep. Well, I, I also think, you know, if it, if it chops wood or agricultural stuff, well, it probably is going to chop people well, cause they're not usually as hard. No. Well, yeah. Once you're, you know, you, you go from the stab to a slice, it, it changes the way you want your blade to work right. and how you want the balance and difference. And yeah, it, I think they, they would chop people very efficiently, as gruesome as that is. But now the copus had enough of a point for stabbing work, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it, it didn't drop down and be as – like the kukri is very dropped down. The the copus okay. still had a very decent – you know, I think that's a good all-around type of, of knife as far as design goes. I think it's a very efficient in its design. I've – I've never handled one, but it looks like it would handle really well. Like that point is still in line when you're in a saber grip. It looks like it's going to go right where you want it to. Oh, yeah. You could thrust with it easily. Well, a lot of these, you, you see the picture of it. You just want to hold one. You want to grab it. Same with a lot of these sabers and the knives we've talked about. You know, I've never held one, but I, you look at it and you're just like, I just want to hold that thing and see the, feel the balance mm-hmm. and feel, you know, the history of it, I guess. That makes any sense at all? Oh, it makes perfect sense. No, I I agree a hundred percent, Michael. Looking at a lot of these older swords, it's like I wish there was a place you could go to actually handle them, like uh, yeah. the Kopish from Egypt. I've always thought that's interesting, but I've never handled one. Yeah, that'd be a, a business that probably wouldn't stay in you know business very long. Hold this knife. <laughs> no, I know. Right, there'd be pretty cool to have <laughs> it a at a show point. if 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 you know. At a show if someone had a display or something that you could handle. I'm thinking more of like a kid's hands-on museum, but with... <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> hands-off museum. Well, where did his hand go? <laughs> nice. I see what you did there. What? <laughs> We're going to file that high on the li- the Mark of the Maker worst idea list ever. No way, man. There is nothing wrong with an edged weapon petting zoo. <laughs> <laughs> The Kids Combat Blade Hands-On Museum. Come on down. Mm-hmm. Bring the wife. Half price on Saturday. I think I think it's under eight. Get uh, in for free. <laughs> Don't worry. We got little knives for them. It's cool. Seems, right, seems right. like Jerry Hossum, some of his stuff feels kind of cool. Uh, now, I know something. Jerry did a modern rendition of the Copus. I've seen pictures of it. And as with all of Jerry's work, it's superb. Oh, I bet. Yeah, I can't imagine that wouldn't be a wicked blade. Oh, you know. You know it'd probably Very be quick cool. as a hiccup, too. Oh, yeah. Nice and light. And never heard that one before. Nice. Quick as a hiccup? Yeah, never That's heard. pretty quick. Yeah, right? Well, so quick it's subtle. A lot of shit Sean says I've <laughs> never heard before, but I like it when he says it. <laughs> All right. Very nice. Yeah. Look, yeah. A little looking online suggests that, yeah, maybe the difference between those two, not those two knives or swords or blades is mainly regional, yeah. right? Yeah. The same so. design. Yeah. Another one of those. Ooh, that worked well. Yeah. Let's take this home and copy it exactly. Mm-hmm. The original Poor tracers. 
tracers. Did we <laughs> did we give the spelling of copus for people that aren't yeah, familiar? I believe so, but hitting it again won't hurt. K O P K O P I S. In stereo. That was in stereo. Whoa. Now I got moving in stereo in my head. That's actually not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you think about PB Kate's down. tits. Yeah. <laughs> Another good movie, guys. Go watch it. Yeah, if you haven't seen Fast Times at Ridgemont High, it's not quite what Apocalypse Now is, but it ain't bad either. (laughs) Not the cinematic triumph that Apocalypse Now is. Breakfast Club and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Watch all three. Don't watch the TBS version of Fast Times. What? Spicoli does not call Mr. Hand a fuzzy nerd. Trust me on that. (laughs) No. Yeah. (laughs) A fuzzy nerd. That is so bad. Like watching all the lethal weapons and stuff when they were on there. Flip you. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Michael, what's your number three? I went with the Bolo. Now, this one's a bit tougher to nail down because it's sort of a catch-all name for a lot of different knives. But you start getting into the Filipino um, knives, and it is rich and badass blades. Um, they got a lot of cool stuff. Oh God, they do. And a lot of those have been translated into machetes and Bolo is sort of the idea of a machete. The name Bolo is, but there is a certain shape that we all kind of associate with the Bolo, which is sort of a brown or barang brong type of shape, uh, just sort of your basic machete shape. Um, and it was used basically the general version of it was used for clearing vegetation um, basically trailblazing, kind of like what your machete would do. And then it was also used in your like uh, FMA, your Filipino martial arts stuff, which I would have to assume would be wickedly nasty. Devastating. Yeah. Period. And a lot of a lot of crazy knives came out of the, the Filipino martial arts and stuff, your karambit and stuff like that. Just painful stuff. But the interesting thing is like – the U.S. Army took on the Bolo knife, and I think there was four or five iterations they did. Um, but the most popular was the 1917. Um, do you guys know that one? Yeah, I've actually very cool. Piece. Handled one of those recently. Yeah, Kane's a, best friend's oh. dad just picked up an antique one and was showing it to me. It's very cool. I think they did one in 1910 and 1908 or something. But there's been a few different versions of it. But the 1917 was by far the most popular, and, and it stuck. No, 1887, 1904, 1909, and then the 1917. And now the 1917 I saw had a zero grind on it. And this was from the factory. This was in original condition and it had a fairly stubby really? zero grind on it. Was it? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Huh. Some of those were made by uh, something called, someone called Plum was the company that made a bunch of those. But it's one of those where they, it, it kind of got passed around and, you know, different folks yeah. made it and sourced around. Yeah. But man, it, it's just a, it's a very kind of iconic shape and it's still used in a lot of machete shapes these days. And in, in a lot of oh. modern bush, you know, I was going to say bushwhacking type of knives. So it's kind of a family of knives. It, right? it is. You know, you had, yeah. you had sort of a shorter cutting one. You had sort of a recurved almost root digging version, you know, it's sort of a catch all name, but then we kind of took on that one shape we all liked. And that turned into sort of the bolo knife that we think of in our heads, you know, cause there's a certain shape that we all think of when you say bolo, but it means more than more than one. Now, what I think of when I hear bolo is I'm thinking a straight spine, very straight spine. Mm -hmm. Then with a Big ass fucking sow belly on it. I mean, we're talking a belly that'd drag a ground if it had legs. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that weight forward. Mm-hmm. It's pretty funny when you look this in uh, the Wikipedia entry up for this. It's like, uh, oh, bolo. There's a version that's specifically dis- shaped for digging out roots and weeding. <laughs> okay, you know, farming implement. Next one says used to harvest rice. Okay, yeah, farming implement. The next one says. Traditionally tipped in snake, spider, or scorpion venom and used for self defense. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so it goes like uh, business, business, don't fuck mm-hmm. with me. Business, business, personal. 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, back to that sort of agricultural type knife that turned into something sort of deadly. Right. But yeah, it's it's a it's a very I think uh, influential shape for sure in a lot of knives these days. You put two bolos together, spine to spine, you have a smatchet blade shape. Uh huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> Very nice. You should That's another cool knife. You should make that. I got to learn to grind first. Your, be your version <laughs> of the uh, the twin Chinese uh, swords. Oh, dude, I would love to make a set of butterfly swords. The butterfly, yeah, Sh- yeah. D guards and big wide blades. What's not to like? Anybody that grew up in the eighties, man, American Ninja. <laughs> I was more of a Revenge of the Ninja, Enter the Ninja sort of guy. Yeah, all that stuff. I'm yeah. I'll, Butterfly knives. If you grew up in that era, you wanted butterfly knives. Oh, At least I did. And you also oh, wanted- I had several. You wanted the uh, the spikes that helped you climb a tree and yep. all that shit. The and little tassel and throwing, throwing stars and a kusari gama and- Some cow trips that throw behind you and I don't know who the- Because <laughs> just in case. Yeah, you know. Shit. Yeah. Right. We were some nerds growing up. You know that? <laughs> Man, I've actually seen caltrips get used uh, during the well, mine we strikes in Pike awesome. County. They threw them out in front of coal trucks. They'd oh, make them out of roof and nails and shit. Really? Yeah, seriously. Huh. Wow. I feel like that's a, a better use than me as a kid. No one was following me. <laughs> <laughs> Any of you guys like make a throwing star out of a bicycle chain ring? Not out of a chain ring, but I, I tried grinding. No, so. but I wish I had. Or the sprocket thing, you know? That would have been a oh, smarter they were great. use. Uh, that, They're super, super heavy. I will tell you, though, if you have a, there's a certain um, uh, machine used for farming and whatnot that has these little triangle, um, little cutting discs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The hay rake or the cutter. Yeah. I did sharpen a few of those and toss them poorly. Did you guys have, I mean, at the state fair, did you guys get the cheap ass little throwing stars? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got them at the flea market, but yes, I know those. Of yeah, those speak. things were awesome, right? I got Until those. Until I threw them into the woods after the fourth throw, yeah. We used to stick them in the, the wall at the bathroom at school. <laughs> get those, Get the. I'd get the Pakistan survival knife and I'd get the Def Leopard mirror. You know what I'm talking Maybe about. set. That was Def I need me. I think I had Def one of those too, mirror. probably. <laughs> right? What the heck was up with that? <laughs> the, yeah. the State Fair trifecta, what, right? The fair there. mirrors. Yeah, yeah, those were awesome. <laughs> oh my! I think we all had that. I really liked hearing Sean's love of the Smatchet resurface. Just it's a gorgeous knife. Dude, the malicious intent behind that knife. I dig it. Yeah. So I yeah. cleaning the shop, moving stuff around. I found a. A big smatch it played out of like quarter inch D2 that I never finished. Dibs. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those that I've always wanted to make, but never just that's a lot of grinds. Man, that's a daunting task. Hell yeah. And if you want to do it proper, it's going to be wide. You're going to be at that grinder for a while. Yeah. A- AG made some, they were drop forged. I don't know if you remember those. They were like, recessed in the middle the edge was a little thicker i've got a picture of one um somewhere i can find it but uh bob used to make the guards for those and one of them caught in the mill once and it spun it around and about chopped his hand off he ended up having some tendon and ligament surgery because of it damn yeah yeah those things they will mess you up yeah we could probably do a whole episode on you know military knives you know or just to smash it. That would be fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the smash it episode. I could do that. Well, there's so many cool military knives. Oh, yeah. All right. So we we went through nine of these, and um, we don't really do a very good job of consistently following up and posting in the Facebook group, but we'll, we should try to do that and get some pictures out there for people. So uh, if you guys have pictures from your research or bookmarks okay. that you saved, why don't you grab some pictures and we can put them in the Facebook group and save people some hassle on going to find some of these. I already got some set aside. Well, there you go. Mr. Prepared. Mm-hmm. Man, I am glad that that is on tape because I have never been called that before. Woo. I was yeah, like. The whole show prep <laughs> is kind of. Kicking my ass. And you had a birthday. 
Yeah. 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 The other day when we we're going to, we were going to tape, I was putting up uh, decorations. So how many sick jumps have you hit on that bike? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think you chose well. Uh, but she wants to go so fast in it. I don't like it. I, I have a feeling, I have a feeling Michael's not a r- allowed to ride uh-uh. Harper's bike. No. Nobody rides but me. <laughs> you can ride on the handlebars. I'll toot you, but don't sit on the seat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, girl is in charge. I like it. So she seems to think she is. So we had we had a couple bonus knives. Do we want to do those or no? But man, I, I think with the way we've moved through these, one each ain't going to hurt nothing. I think we got time. All right. So Tom, you want to talk briefly about your bonus knife? Sure. Uh, bonus knife. Uh, I chose the Chris. Ooh. Um, the Chris has always been one of those knives that kind of caught my eye. Um, growing up in Lincoln, Nebraska, not a lot to do in the wintertime. And we would go to uh, the museum quite a bit. And there was a, a place called, it's actually called Morrill Hall, but we called it Elephant Hall when we were growing up. <clears throat> They've got like a like a full skeleton of a mammoth up and on display there, but they had a weapons section and uh, one of the swords in there is a Chris. They've also got a couple Moro swords and some Brongs and some pretty cool stuff, but a lot of like uh, Asian influence type stuff there. Um, the Chris though, for me, it it's, it's an iconic piece. It comes from Indonesia, although they also have them in Burma and Malaysia and a couple different other places, but mostly it's Indonesia. And I think actually, if you narrow it down from there, it's Java uh, is like the the most well known place. Probably the birthplace, given the significance of it in the area. Yeah, it's just so cool. Um, and you've you've all seen these. These are the asymmetrical dagger. It looks like the flame. Um, and as a knife maker, you know, it's like, I, it's one of the pieces that I really want to try to make, but it's like, at the same time, I don't want to fail. And I, it's just like at that next pinnacle of uh skill for me, uh, I, I do not feel that I have the skill to pull it off. And even though I really want to, I just, I just don't have it, you know, and the craftsmanship, if you see some of these old ones, I mean, it's like the hilt is it, you know, the blade just widens out and there's a lot of these have super intricate carvings back there. Right. Um, just really, really cool pieces. So, uh, that was, that was my last, uh, bonus pick. Nice. So the super cool. So when people want to look up the Chris, it's K R I S. And for folks who are, um, Oh, I don't know. Extremely bored or dedicated listeners, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. <laughs> who have who listened to our um, Skagel history episode? The Chris is uh, was his Skagel's logo. logo. Yeah, his maker's mark. And so th- this is a dagger that has uh, sort of like a snake like wiggly shaped blade. So lots of people I think will will recognize the name and know what we're talking about right away. But for folks that don't, it's definitely worth looking up. It's crazy looking dagger. Yeah, and and during that episode, we kind of talked about how did Skagel come up with this, and and that was kind of an interesting discussion. We still want to know. We still want to know. Yeah, Yeah. we we still don't know, but you know, he he was a merchant marine, and you know, our thought was he may have got over there. Yeah. So, if it's done correctly, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous look. Which uh, man for recent Chris's? Do you guys remember the kissing crane stiletto? Yeah, Uh Chris blades. Yeah, those were pretty cool, dude. And Jody Sampson ground a lot of the ballet songs with the Chris blade, and those things are pretty. Yeah, he wicked, did, didn't he? Wicked, awesome grinds. It seemed like somebody did a also did a modern uh, ballet song with the Chris blade that was really well done. Uh, other uh, than I believe Daraspina knives has done a couple fixed versions. Hmm. Oh, Richard. Yeah, yeah. He he's a he's uh, he's a grinding fool, man. He his karambits and stuff are pretty out outstanding. Nice. Sean, you got a bonus you want to throw out there? Yes. I pick the Parang or Parang as my bonus. Yeah. It's from the Malay Archipelago. It's their preferred machete. And there's a similar thinking to the design as the Golok and Bolo from the area. 
uh, one of the things that separates it is the blade is usually traditionally divided up into three sections as far as the grind goes. The portion closest to the handle is kind of a medium height grind, so you can do draw work and some carving work with it. In front of that, you have a much more blunt kind of grind. It doesn't go anywhere near as high, so you have your chopping area that's more resilient to abuse and you know hard contact with shit it shouldn't be hitting. And then the very forward portion of the blade is ground extra thin, so you can do fine, fine detail work chop, choking up on it and holding it at the spine. Very cool. Yeah, uh, they're a really neat knife. That's another one that's kind of seen a little bit of a resurgence in uh, choppers, the shape. Yeah, the bushcraft scene. Yeah, well, and because it works, it's proven. It's interesting you talk about choking up. When I was in Thailand, I'd often see people, uh, you know, in our, in, in the States and stuff, we think about, oh, it's five inch blade. That's too big to use or whatever. You know, if you were smart, you'd have a three inch blade, but I'd see people over there, they'd have one knife, you know? And so if you can only have one knife, you want a big one and they would choke up like you're talking, they'd hold the very tip of the, you know, last three inches of the knife and the rest of it rested against their, the spine was up against their forearm and they would they could do anything with those knives The the amount of dexterity they could bring to bear on tasks was pretty awesome. Yeah. Very cool. And uh, these were, or, and probably still are a favorite of Malaysian criminal organizations. Huh? Yeah. You yep. Chop people up. Yeah. Well, man, you see it, uh, like, especially in South America, the machete, you see the machete used in a lot of crimes, South Africa and I, or Africa, yeah. Africa, period, the machete gets used a lot. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. that's a sad situation. Yeah. So the Parang, look, it also has kind of a distinctive handle shape, right? Where it's got like a snake head or a parrot's head kind of yeah, yeah. end on the handle typically. Yeah, it generally, well, some kind of flare. It's made to stay in your hand when you're swinging it hard. Right, yeah. right. A lot, of, uh, a lot of similarities in the handle design in some of these ethnic knives as far as, you know, retention. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's something there. It's not just a straight handle. There's there's something there to keep it there. Yeah. Well, you see flares, you see bird's heads, and you see semi-enclosures and enclosures around the hand. Very cool. Good choice. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we definitely uh, we definitely took a little trip around the world in this conversation, didn't we? And, that, and it's kind of interesting, the timeline. It, uh, it would have been interesting to kind of lay this out in order, but I think when people start to look at the pictures of these different things, it shouldn't be too hard for them to say, oh, yeah, I can see some of so-and-so's knife or design or shape in that. Um, these are strong influences for lots of stuff that we see out there today. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to get like a, a big board with lots of yarn and pictures of these things and just you could I bet you could put it all up and have one hell of a very lonely couple of weeks. You got a beautiful mind, man. (laughs) (laughs) As soon as I started saying, I was like, that is going to show my awful weird side. Yes. Uh, If they haven't noticed by episode 17, I think you're safe. (laughs) (laughs) Delete. (laughs) Uh, We're we're still missing an extra one, right? Yeah. Yeah. We got to hit Michael's XT. Oh, uh, he didn't. Oh. He didn't pick a bonus. But if he wants to pick one on the fly, you let her rip. Uh, let's go with the uh, fucking. Uh, let's go with the the bearded. <laughs> let's go with the bearded Viking axe. The short Viking axe. Nice. I'm gonna toss oh, this in because cool. if we're talking about fighting weapons, this is an effective uh, foot soldier fighting weapon. You can hide it behind your shield. Uh, uh, you can. It was very effective at um, chopping. At people through armor in their creases, and you can also take that mm-hmm. beard and pull your opponent's axe or a shield down, um, yeah. and use your other hand to stab. Uh, very effective. I'm gonna toss that out as an honorable mention. And they they threw them also. Yeah, you right? get through them or throw them. You can hide it behind your shield. Um, you can you know it just it was a very effective piece. Uh, very light, uh, thin. You know, we, we kind of think of these as, you know, as a chopping type of thing, like we think of our wood, but it was a very uh, balanced piece yeah, when they were done correctly. Dexterous hand axe. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, and after afterwards, after you defeated your enemies, you could build a fire to celebrate. <laughs> Hand, handy tool. Yeah. Deadly. <laughs> They're really. Uh, I like Tom's version of the story. Oh, I'm going to go slay my foes, and then I'm going to exercise my bushcraft skills. Yeah. We need a little Conan right there. Hi, yeah. adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now we're talking. Uh, should we? Well, very cool. Be brought back into the modern age and talk about uh, the show coming up. I think so. I think so. So right around the corner here, where I got to try to get this thing edited and published before the show. So I'm going to try to do that this weekend. But coming up very, very shortly. How shortly, Michael? Beat shit out of me too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Almost exactly a week from today. We're recording this on Thursday, the 23rd. So next week, the uh, last week of August is the. USN Gathering Show out in Las Vegas. And uh, well, we thought we had two weeks. <laughs> what? Right. I wish. <laughs> we know you don't think that, Tom, because of the doomsday clock. I don't have it set up yet. What? Dang it. I know. You're kind of missing the point of a clock. Well, I don't want to set it up because we're getting ready. I'm having to empty my whole office here in the next uh, week or so for the redo. So. I don't want to set it up. I've got it in storage for a little bit. Yeah, well. But it'll be out for the next Doomsday show. can wait another day. Mm -hmm. So Vegas shows right around the corner, and uh, we're going to talk just briefly about the gathering because there are some differences there. It's a different kind of show. And uh, Sean, you want to talk a little bit about what's up with the gathering while we're bringing it up here again? Well, we're talking about The Gathering because it's one of the coolest shows going, if not the coolest. It's just a ton of fun. It's a must-do show at least once so you can say you did it and see how awesome it is. And we would be remiss if we didn't retouch on etiquette a little bit. And there are certain etiquette issues that are specific to The Gathering that we're going to talk about. And the uh, first one to talk about, don't be a douche. That's a big one. Just yeah. <laughs> a little bit of common sense and courtesy goes a long way. That's a life lesson. Yeah. Well, like we talked on the other ones, don't don't handle the knives, don't don't or don't handle them like they're your own. They are not bought until you actually spend money on them. So treat them gently. You can open it once or something, and that's all you really didn't you need to do to feel the action or whatever. Don't don't be wrist flipping it, don't be any of that weird shit we talked about before. Now, let's talk about a few of the things that are specific to The Gathering. Uh, the Gathering's a big show, but it's a small show, too. And it's not set up in the traditional show way that we're used to. It's set up in quads. Right. So for, for people who haven't, who haven't uh, been there before, the, the quads are basically four tables with their backs to one another, forming kind of like a circle or a square. Square. Yeah. And uh, and then there's sort of a center table in between them to give them a little bit more space or to separate a little bit. But they're like these little pods as you walk around. And so instead of being long, <laughs> seemingly endless rows like at Blade Show, there are uh, these little uh, quads where there's four makers all in one spot. Pretty good design as far as the knife show goes. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I the thing I like about it is that there is that little bit of space behind you. So if you got, if you need some food or you got to need a place to put some stuff down or whatever, there's sort of a shared private space in the center. Yeah. You've got your table in the center and every, you know, you put your drinks on it or set your lottery bags or whatever. Mark, do you have any, uh, Oh, little etiquette things you could hit on real fast as far as like what we covered before. Well, I mean, I would like to say something real quick. I mean, instead of all the, you know, we said don't be a douche, don't uh, don't treat them like they're yours. But the awesome thing about a show is that you do get to handle stuff. Just be sure and ask, you know. Yeah. Uh, if you ask, it's totally fine. Treat them with respect. But that's the best thing about shows. You get to handle these knives, feel the balance, you know, strike up a conversation with a maker. Right. Yeah, just be respectful. I, you know, if you have questions about it, go back and listen to the etiquette thing because we really did. We covered it in depth, but be respectful of knives. Yeah, I mean, there there was a question uh, recently I saw in one of the Facebook groups where someone asked about bringing a backpack. And we talked about that in the etiquette episode as well. And 
And I think, um, yeah, it's okay to bring a backpack, but you should bring a very small one if you do. And you should be careful that you don't go banging into the people around you. And, you know, I've watched people get nearly knocked over by someone with a backpack who spun around and uh, it's not good. Right. So, yeah, bring your pack or whatever, but bring a small version of it and um, be be careful of those around you and don't, don't go slamming it. it down on someone's table. Yeah. About what I was about to say. Don't yeah, set it on the table. Don't do that. Totally messed up, but the movie Road Trip just came into my mind when you're talking about all this stuff, knock, <laughs> knocking stuff off. <laughs> you know, at the end when he knocks all the stuff off the table. Anyways, sorry. What are you talking about? That's another great movie. <laughs> at the end, anyways. National Lampoon's there, Road Trip. Road Trip. It's a great, uh, you know, a stiffler. Uh-huh. Anyways. <laughs> For some reason I, in my I, head, I heard Roadhouse, and I'm like, what the hell does Roadhouse have to do with no, damn no, backpacks? Geez. This is much higher level of cinema than Roadhouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that, man. We have the shittiest movie recommendations. I mean, we had to throw some gems in there, but then we have a bunch yeah. of goofy-ass shit that shows I don't know. Up. That movie's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Make me some blueberry pancakes. <laughs> yeah. As soon as Stifler gets involved in the conversation, <laughs> it, it's hard to stand behind it, Tom. I know, but come on. Sorry. Yeah. Don't so knock yeah, stuff off tables. The, the Vegas show is really, it's <laughs> its a fun show. It's a, it, it's a smaller show. It's gotten a lot bigger over the last several years. Um, and, you know, that's got stuff that goes along with it. It gets harder to get around and see everything. There's lots and lots of people there. It's become an extremely popular show, but it still has that vibe like a small show, which is cool. And uh, I think it's a very comfortable feeling show, right? You know, you're going to see a bunch of people, you know, there. Um, it's just like a more like-minded crowd than a big giant show like a blade. Yeah. This is probably my favorite show. Uh this in New York, just because they're smaller and more personable, you know, there's not as many people, not as many, much stuff to see. So you get to actually spend more time talking to people. And I don't know, it's a, it's a really more, much more laid back show than blade. It is. Well, I just, and there are makers who set up at the gathering who don't exhibit anywhere else. Yeah. Right. I think you're, right. you're finding that a lot with a lot of different shows these days. It, it just, there's yeah. so many shows and so little time that people are starting to, Kind of whittle them down. Well, we're switching back to a little more of a regional vibe. Yeah. Well, and th that's where this this smaller show is nice. I just the Vegas part gets to me. I, I get. I'm not a huge. I Vegas love fan. Vegas. Man. I know Tom. I know you love Vegas and the, the food and stuff, but it's the noise. It's it's a constant noise. Yeah, I can see that. That gets to me. Yeah, if Vegas is your thing, it's a really fun time. There's because it's in Vegas. There's tons of stuff to do at night. There's lots of places to go eat. There's lots of things to do outside the show. Oh yeah. Some people aren't some people aren't Vegas people and you get Vegas out really fast. Maybe. Um the <laughs> the cool part is that you know there's social activities in the evening. So like at Blade show when people go down into the pit, um at the USN show uh the the show itself takes place on this mezzanine and attached to the mezzanine uh, is a bar and the bar basically gets rented out uh, by the USN show folks. And right. it's sort of the live version of the cove. That's the concept anyway. And um, that's, so there's a place to hang out at night where basically all the same people from the show will be. So just like uh, happens at blade show where everybody shows up in the pit, folks will show up in this cove area uh, at the same hotel in the same spot. So if you don't want to deal with the whole crazy Vegas craziness. You don't have to. You can hang out there at the uh, at the Cove area and up on the mezzanine, and you know, venture out to get some food and come back if you want to. Yeah. For people that aren't a hundred percent that that don't know USN, you know, super deep or don't pay for a Cove. Cove on the USN is where it's the for sale area. So this is a, the place. It's okay to kind of bring some stuff and trade and sell and all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, you know, but, we talk about. Brown bagging and stuff like that. Yeah, don't brown bag. And but, same goes with your uh, your. But you're not brown bagging in the cove. I mean, that's that's well, part um, of what. I was right. doing a sweet segue about not brown bagging your liquor there, Tom. It was sweet. 
No, I was going to say they're uh, they sell. Did I mess tickets. it up? No, it's fine. It's smooth. No, it's, oh, it's seamless. okay. Sorry. Seamless. No one nice. really noticed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's almost like we rehearsed it. Yeah, but they <laughs> uh, they they sell drink tickets, so don't don't uh, don't bring a bunch of of store bought beer into the the cove. You know, they, or the they, show. They make money. Yeah, or the show. Yeah, they make money off selling alcohol there. So don't don't bring any. Now yeah. there is the mezzanine though outside of there, which um, I tend to do whatever you want. Well, I tend to stay out there because I'm I, I don't like the smoke as much. It gives me a, a massive headache, and, and there tend yeah. to be some smoke in the the cove. So I kind of stay on the outskirts, yeah. just a yeah, little some. bit. <laughs> yeah, you mean a mid chest cloud that just kind of hangs there and clings? <laughs> Pretty right, much. Right. I the point is I can't I can't. Can't handle it too long. I, I'll dip in and and say hi to people and, and dip back out to the mezzanine. And that's it's pretty much right outside of the cove. It's basically this large area that's sort of empty. And it, it was actually where the first USN show was. Yeah, it was on this mezzanine kind of. Well, I, I think it's interesting. It seems like you know, over the last couple of years, there's more and more people outside in the mezzanine uh, versus being actually in the cove. And I think a lot of that has to do with the smoke. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just it's not for me. I can't. Yeah, can't do it. Yeah, it tears me up too. So I'll be outside with uh, Birch and the mezzanine. I think for people who haven't been to the the gathering before, it's worth venturing into the cove for sure because oh, yeah. um, there's a lot going on. There's a yeah. ton of people in there. Uh, there will be people like Tom said. It's totally okay to bring your personal knives. Um, to sell or yeah. trade or other gear. You can bring all that stuff. And there's a bunch of little bar tables. You can put your stuff on these little bar tables and it could be you, that you just bring some cool stuff that you want to show off. Show off. Yeah. But, yeah. but if you have some stuff like you would at a get normal little get together, but if you have things you want to sell, that's an okay place for you to bring your stuff to sell. You collectors shouldn't sell on the show floor and makers should not bring their shit to the cove instead of buying a table. Um, yeah. That's happened before. It's, that is brown bagging loud and clear. Don't do that. Falls under that. Don't be a douche rule. A lot of this, that umbrella covers a lot of stuff. Right. <laughs> the douche umbrella. Okay. So the douche umbrella. Yeah. One, one of the other things that's different about the Vegas show is uh, the way lotteries work. And uh, there will be some people probably that do a beep beep, like a text message style lottery. Yep. Um, there will be some people who do, uh, a small lottery at their table. I think Sean, you did something right at your table in the past, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, but there will be a, a, a an entire schedule of lotteries that happen in the corner of the room. There's an elevated stage set up off in the corner of the room, and uh, that will be a live lottery. So to enter the lotteries in uh, most of the lotteries at the Vegas show, you'll go to the maker's table. There'll be a little card. You tear the card in half, you keep half, the maker has a bucket or a bag that the cards go in, and then at a certain time on one of the days, um, your favorite maker will go up and stand on the stage and call out numbers, and it's a little more of a excitement, live lottery kind of thing. Uncomfortably. Yeah. It, uh, Uncomfortably but, for Michael. Yeah, and I don't but, think yeah. anybody has utilized it the way it should be utilized yet. Period. Yeah. You could make it a fun time. You could get people hyped up instead of just standing up there thanking people and pulling names. Right. I think, I think uh, Jade does a pretty good job of that. But they Jade does. But that's at their table. Yeah, that's back. But I mean, the same kind of thing. He he has some fun. Um, and Ernie has his in the cove, right? Yeah, Ernie has his as a special event. So Emerson Custom Knives, you'll enter the lottery in the show floor, but then he does it in the evening off in the cove room. Yeah. yeah. And a couple of lottery rules. Don't, don't do not enter more than once. It, it won't be pretty. Just don't, don't do it. Um, if you have, if your wife is there and has a ticket, if she wins, she comes up and gets it. Not you, not someone else, whatever. It's, it's her stuff. You know, it, whoever wins, it needs to be there. And I think Mark Mark has covered this a couple times. If the maker, you know, says all this stuff is okay, maybe find a new maker. I think he says it a lot more eloquently than that, but the point is there. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, 
the whole show thing, some people have a very sore thing about shows where they feel like they're getting um, duped somehow or that the lotteries are rigged or the knives are all sold before people show up or whatever. And um, I, I can't say that that doesn't happen at all. That said, if you if you go to Vegas to see your favorite maker and your favorite maker sells all his shit before the doors open, find a new favorite maker. That's how it's said. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I'm not trying to stick my finger in anybody's eye, but at the same time, some of this stuff gets turned into like a, a conversation about dealers and whatever. And okay, well, dealers, guess what? They pay to get into the show to be able to buy knives so they can turn around and sell them. But, you know, everybody, everyone's complicit in this. No one's going to a table and holding a gun to a maker's head and telling them to sell the knives or they're out. So, you know, well, every, and, everybody's got a role. And I've even had a conversation with dealers, you know, if some of these guys uh, were bringing like six, seven, eight people. And I just had nope. a talk with them and I said, hey, listen, here's the deal <clears throat> for you, for any dealer that bring someone else, I'll let you enter one more person. So if you bring a spouse or you bring an employee or whatever, you bring three employees, I'll let a dealer enter twice. You know, if they have six employees, you still get two for a dealer. That's it. Cause they're, yeah. they're buying tickets for these people, but I'm just not going to let all those people in on the, on the lotto, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does make sense, and it's and it's tough to try to make it as fair as we can, but we do. We do try to make it fair. You know, but I mean, it, dealers come and they try to make money at this too, and if they bring multiple people, I I let them have two, but that's about it. But yeah, don't complain about a dealer doing that and then go off and sell to a dealer for this amount of money. You know, there's well, lots of weird stuff that goes on and can get wrapped up in this when it comes to making money off a knife. And it's an incredibly tangled web because of oh, yeah. what involved. Hell yeah. When so you- suffice to say, there's sh- some shady makers, there's some shady dealers, and there's plenty of shady collectors, believe me, <laughs> who, who do some shady shit. So, But I think most of us try to do the right thing. I, I mean- No, I, I agree. I'm just saying that it's not yeah. like any one of those three is the devil alone. No. Oh, no. And, and try not to perpetuate it, you know? it. In my original version of the indecent proposal used to be when someone would shoot me a message before a show and offer me money for a knife, you know, and be like, I'd be like, I can't, it's a knife. It's a show that's going to the knife and they would offer a goodly amount of money. What did I say? The opposite? You said it's a show going to a knife. Uh, Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, Okay. (laughs) But uh, they would offer a hellacious amount of money and I almost to the point I wouldn't want to say anything to my wife because it puts you in a weird spot. <laughs> it's an indecent proposal because I'm I have to say no yeah. because it's a you know a knife going to a show, but it just sucks. You yeah. Know? Well, another that- good movie. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen that. <laughs> factually, not, not factually, <laughs> there are factually there are people that do that. Yeah. I mean, oh, and yeah. that's why I say there's shady people on all different sides. So it's like, oh, well, I got to the floor and my favorite knife wasn't available. It was already sold. Okay, well, believe me, there are, are a number of collectors um, who are willing to spend money who will go offer a maker money before doors for a lottery knife. Yeah. And sometimes makers sell to them. If your favorite maker does that, find a new favorite maker. That's what the open bid is for and the closed bid. It it is. I'm just saying. But yeah, no, I agree with what you're saying, Mark. Hundred percent, dude. <laughs> it was like conversation about you know, oh well, there's a good friend of mine and whatever, and this you know they sold my knife. I was all the night didn't have any knives left when I got to the floor. Okay, well, guess what? Your guy fucked up. Buy from somebody else, right? I don't care if he's your friend or not. Yeah. I you know it's not like anyone twists someone's arm to sell the knives. The 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 starting time for the sale of the knives is one hundred percent. At the discretion of the maker. Yep. That's a fact. Oh, yeah. Pretty, no pretty, one forces the maker to sell at any time. Yep. Pretty funny story, Mark. I did. I ordered a knife from a guy. He was supposed to deliver it to me at Blade. Showed up, 
bringing the knife to me, saw some dude beforehand, sold the knife to that dude. I didn't ever get the knife. Yeah. Wow. Sh- th- there are yeah, shady I never, makers. I never ordered there- another one. <laughs> Good. <laughs> there are shady makers. There are shady collectors. There are shady dealers. There's shady people, man. It's the real world. So there. we'd like to think that, you know, a show like the USN show where there's some overarching um, community kind of thing that's supposed to go along with the whole USN deal. You'd like to think that that would help the show be more uh, straight or legit or honorable. And I think generally speaking, it is. Yeah. But the reality is that there's money involved. And when there's money involved, people do shady shit sometimes. So yeah. no one should be surprised, right? Yeah. Everyone should, deals with plenty of shady people in their real regular lives. But it goes on at shows to pay attention and adjust accordingly is my personal advice. I, th- I think you should be surprised. And what else? But, There's yeah. tons of good ones of good dealers, good makers, good good buyers. Find them, you know. Right. Support them. Can we talk about the best part of Vegas? The food. <laughs> what is yeah. best in life? The food in Vegas is awesome. All right. What are some of your? I kind of expected ones? one of you guys to come out with like hooker and blow or something, but no, the food. Ew. Man, both of those are felonies, and I don't do that sort of thing. <laughs> right. What kind of Vegas you visited? Sean is a virtuous person. Well, if you find virtue in vice, you're just a different breed of cat now, ain't you? <laughs> you're my kind of people. Yeah, the food in Vegas is awesome. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, uh, the two best meals I've had in my life were in Vegas. Uh, Where were do they? Tell. Where were they at? Uh, yeah. The first one was at Lupo by Wolfgang Puck. A uh, fantastic Italian place, very authentic, great service, great atmosphere, delicious, delicious, well-prepared food. Just a phenomenal place for a meal. And it's kind of snazzy, so if you want to take your lady somewhere nice, you can take her there. And she'll feel like you actually took her somewhere. Nice. Oh, very nice. The other one? And then the uh, second one, this is at the Cosmo. It's within easy walking distance of the show venue. And uh, it's called, uh, I think it's pronounced Jaleo, J-A-L-E-O. And it's a tapas restaurant. And, you know, small plates, bunch of different foods. You kind of take what you want. I think we had either an eight or 12 course meal. And Nice. Oh, that's a, that's, those are, the tapas places are fun. Oh, this was a great, great time. I mean, we were seated around a table on couches, very relaxed atmosphere, fantastic food and service. I think I know where that is. I think we wanted to go there. Is there like a, a Mexican Chinese fusion place next to it? I think so. Yeah. Don't get the duck tongue tacos. Not good. Oh, no boy. bueno. Man, at Jalio, one of the best bites I had is they had these little lettuce wraps that were basically just lettuce and goat cheese and like this honey oh. drizzle and shit, uh, shaved almonds. Jeez, man, it's one of the best delicious. single bites I've ever had in my life. That ain't no shit. Huh. There's a, there's also, I think it's a floor up. There's a Japanese restaurant in Cosmo and their specialty is fried chicken and it is amazing. Is it called it's KFC? Really good. <laughs> no, it's a Japanese restaurant, man. It was good. What's uh what's some of your favorite places there, Tom? Um honestly, uh the strip house right there in Planet Hollywood is a actually a pretty good place if you're they've they've got these steak crostini things at the bar that are pretty amazing. And their steak's yeah. good. It's a it's actually a pretty good restaurant to eat at. But uh probably my favorite restaurant in Vegas is called Lotus of Siam. And it's a Thai restaurant and it's, nice. it used to be off the strip, but I think they closed oh. that place down for renovation and they've got one on the strip that's open now, but it's actually a, it's a different Thai cuisine than you'll normally get. It's Northern Thai and they've got a red duck curry that is, it'll blow your mind. It's so good. It's, it's a really good place. It's a fun place to go with a big group. They can handle it. And uh, just order family style, and you get a lot of good food. Huh. Um, there's Paris. also a lot of – what's that? I was going to say in Paris, Paris for uh, breakfast. Yeah, that place is uh, Bonhomie. Yeah. yeah. Bono, Bonhomie is a great outdoor cafe for breakfast. Just zip on over in the morning. Oh, it's real close. Mon- Monomie. That's- oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Monomie. My friend. 
Korean Korean barbecue in in Vegas is actually pretty good, and uh, Chappie usually brings like spam uh, musa- musubi. Is that how you say it? Yep. Which oh. spam spam like freaks me out. Meat in a can, like I don't I don't understand it. It it kind of scares me. But uh, how come you don't corn beef? So I grew up vegetarian, so I didn't really start eating meat until in my twenties, and it's like. Uh. Uh, it's just meat in a can, dude. I don't know. It just, I don't know. It, like I said, it just, it's, it's a me thing versus a, a rational thing. But uh, those things are delicious. I don't, I don't, you know, it's got spam in it, a lot of it, but man, it's good. Yeah. Vegas has definitely kind of fashioned itself anymore as a semi foodie destination kind of place, right? And long gone are the days of, um, cheap buffets and being able to eat in Vegas at dinner for five or six bucks or whatever. So a lot of these places are pretty pricey. I think there's some excellent food options in Vegas. Be prepared to spend some money if you want to have a fun and interesting and delicious experience. I mean, there are cheap places to eat in Vegas too that are quite good, but um, if you get off the strip, it's, it gets more normal. Yeah. yeah. But you can, there's high end places too. I mean, like you're saying, good tacos. It, it, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I want to say that one. No, there, there are there are some fun places. One of the cool things is that you can grab, you know, ten or fifteen friends and go, you know, make your way to a restaurant somewhere. And there are a whole bunch of places that deal with the big group thing because big groups come to Vegas. So um, you can go with a group and do something fun. A lot easier than you can maybe in Atlanta oh, yeah. or showing up at a little restaurant in New York City at the Jersey Show or whatever. Um, so if you want to go do a big group dinner with your pals, Vegas is a place to do it. Take your big-ass yeah, group to Hofbrau sure. House. You have fun. That yeah. is a rowdy place. Yeah. Yes. Just saying. You, you will have fun. Very fun. And the Hofbrau in Vegas is so much different from the one in Cincinnati. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I would assume so. Man, it's very different. Like the first half bra I went to was the one in Vegas. So then I was like, hell yeah, this place is awesome. We'll go to the one up in Cincy. So we went there very sedate. I would I would imagine so. Really? When I started hooping and hollering at the band, everyone looked at me. <laughs> Standing on the table. Yeah, seriously. It's like they never see that shit. And the waitress came over and I was like, what's the deal with this place? This ain't nothing like the one in Vegas. And she's like, oh, honey, the Vegas one is so different from everywhere else. They've got their own menu and everything. Wow. That's the only re- place, restaurant I've ever been where you end up standing on the table before the night's done. Yeah. The food is actually good, though, <laughs> it's, too. It's very good. And you can get a spanking and you just can't get a <laughs> refill on iced tea ever. Wow. Iced tea isn't exactly their specialty. What's that? D2 and iced tea. Well, dude, I, I don't drink alcohol, so they the only thing they'll refill there is like a, a liter boot of beer. Yeah, they refill those pretty fast. They sure do. They never refill your shot glass of iced tea. Hmm. Oh, boy. Sorry. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, back to the alcohol thing, you know, like any other show, pace yourself. It's super fun time. Lots of friends be there, but it's also easy to get so so wrecked that it's hard to enjoy the show the next day. So, dude, you can make bad decisions. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like you can disappear. make more than your fair share of bad decisions fast in Vegas. So, um, and like we mentioned earlier, the the show itself, I think, is sort of on the hook for selling a certain amount of alcohol or there's a that's part of the way the money is made to deal with the show. So support them. Don't bring booze. Don't bring booze to the show floor and don't bring your own booze into the cove. Those are both uh, establishments that are kind of covered by agreements for um, sales. So you can buy beer inside the show and you can certainly buy drinks in the cove, but you know, you need to buy it at the venue. It's part of how they make their money for the show. So, I mean, it is, it may cost a, a couple bucks more or something, but it helps, you know, support the show. So if you're enjoying the show, don't brown bag it with alcohol and or drinks or anything. Yeah, just buy a couple drink tickets. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. It's a fun show. Enjoy yourselves, you know? Agreed. I feel like there's something I was going to – I wanted to hit on again, but I forgot the hell what the hell it was. 
Oh, now there's something I've got to hit on, and my dear sweet Rachel <laughs> brought this to my attention. Everyone needs to know where the ABC store is. The ABC store, easy to find, and you need to find it because you can get, it's like a small convenience store. And the most yep. important thing they sell, deodorant. <laughs> so nobody there's has a, an excuse. Yeah, there's also a, a Walgreens right around, you know, in the front of the place if you need yeah. medicine or anything. Yeah. And it's not a bad idea to grab some waters and toss in your uh, fridge in the, the hotel room, too. Uh, yeah. And and this is also one of the busiest weekends in Vegas. Uh, Labor Day weekend is very busy time. Yeah, it's pretty pretty crazy time to be in Vegas, but fun stuff. Um, pretty crazy people watching at night. Oh you know, yeah, people. <laughs> lots, lots of people that are going to listen to the show. Been to Vegas, so they understand all that kind of stuff. But anyway, it's a fun show. Uh, definitely worth checking out if you haven't been before. You know, it's gotten bigger, but I think it's still a very fun show and uh, well worth it. Hundred percent. Would you? Did you guys get anything new or? No, I got some bell. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can appreciate that. I ordered some titanium. It should be here Monday. Cool. I feel like I've just had my head down at doing nothing but trying to work on knives and V4s. Yeah. Oh, I'm right there with you. <sighs> What'd you get, Mark? Um, I got a little Microtech UTX 70. So a little teeny Those are tiny so cool. out the front. This guy is, is it, like. What blade? Uh, this is the Hellhound blade. So it's like a crazy looking, slightly upswept Tanto blade with holes. And it, it, it's it got kind of a ton of detail for being. That's really a cool. And such a tiny knife. Yeah. But these things are fun because they'll actually fit like in your watch pocket, your jeans. And it's retracting OTF. So it's just kind of a riot to play with. So. Anyway, I have an old one of these that's a custom. It actually has like a carbon fiber handle on one side and some other stuff that I've had for a long time. And I came across this one. I'm like, oh, I love that. That guy's got a lot going on for a little teeny knife. So I've got one of those I need to send back. It's got uh, green canvas micarta on it. It's an older one. And it, it's the the material um, like swelled. Oh, really? And it pushes on the blade so it won't open. Ah, uh, just goes out about halfway. Huh. Yeah, awesome. And Sean, you're not going to Vegas, right? Nobody. And my family is happy about it. Right. So Tom and Michael, and I'll be at Michael's table with him. Uh, Tom, Michael, and who else is in this? We're all in one quad, right? Yeah. So Lucas Burnley, uh, who was on last time. Oh, yeah. And, Luke uh, Burnley's in there, too. So, yeah, and do you know what the quad number is, Tom? Not is it, off the top It used to be head. 9 or 12 or something. I don't know what it is now. I should I don't know. know. They've added a bunch of more tables. All right. So, yeah, Luke, Luke Burnley, uh, Birch, and Tom all will be at uh, quad 12. Okay. So there's a, there's a map of the show floor out there at usngathering.com, the same place people went to do their pre-registration for the show. Quad 12 is sort of, um, oh, I don't know, two thirds of the way back through the room and kind of toward the left hand end of the room. So it's gotten bigger. That they must have, I know they were talking about opening it up into the room next door. They must have done that because it's quite a bit longer than it was in the past. Yeah. It, it so, does look bigger. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Fun. The layout's quads in the middle and then booths all the way around the outside. There's a whole bunch of people with booths. So it, it's just one of those shows where, even even before I started to um, help Michael at his table, uh, it was definitely a show where you end up knowing so many people or having conversations that so much that it's actually hard to get around and see the show, which is hard to believe because it's it was pretty small. Mm -hmm. it, but it's, there were lots of lots of times where I came home and I said, "Damn, I never even saw that guy." It's crazy that yeah, like I said, it's so laid back. You'll you'll just stay it and talk with somebody for a couple hours, and you won't see everything that you want to see. Well, right. I barely talked to Tom and Luke. Yeah. And they're right behind me. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You stayed with me last year. We shared a room and I still. Yeah. You still didn't talk to me. Uh. Well, that was, that was <laughs> my choice. <laughs> That's a personal thing. <laughs> All right, fellas, you got anything else you wanted to talk about, whether it's ethnic knives or the gathering? Nope. Uh, one comment on the ethnic knives. 
to our listeners who will want may want to research. Uh, orientalarms.com is a fantastic resource for historical edged ethnic cutlery. I can't recommend it enough. I've been visiting it regularly for probably 17 years now. Nice. Very nice. Very cool. I'll check that out. And, and like Sean said at the early part of the episode, you know, we have this Facebook group for Mark of the Maker and, um, there's some pretty cool discussions that happen there and people share some things that they found based on what they heard on the show. And so like Sean suggested, if you decide you have a ethnic knife that you think is cool and you have some information or knowledge about, or you decide to go off and research one on your own that we didn't talk about on the show, or even one that we did, sure. uh, please feel free to post it in there and teach us about it. We're all always interested in learning more about the same kind of stuff. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Well, in, in the, in the same, uh, theme if there's if there's something you guys think would make a great idea for a show pm it to one of us you know we definitely look into that too all right so i think this is kind of wrapping up episode 17 episode 18 we think might be an interview so we got to talk a little bit more about that but coming back from the vegas show we might have a little bit of a stretch so we might end up hitting three weeks between episodes depending on how things go and how folks recover from Vegas and some other things. So stay tuned and we'll let you know more about what episode 18 is going to be and um, when it's going to come out. But we're, we're, we'll try to hold the cadence, but we may need a little more time. So we'll, we'll see how that all shakes out. All right. Well, as always, thanks everybody for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks all. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Hope you dig it. <laughs> To learn more about our makers, you can find Tom Crine on the web at CrineKnives.net, in his Facebook group, Crine Knives, or in his Instagram account, at Crine Knives. For Michael Birch, check BirchTreeBlades.com, Facebook group BirchTree Bladeworks, or Michael's Instagram, at BirchTreeBlades. For myself and the Raygun Bead Project, we're on the web at RaygunDivision.com, we have a Facebook group called Raygun Division or my personal Instagram at M Steiner. For those interested in photos, references from the show, or some discussion about the show itself, you can find us on the web at markofthemaker.com, in a Facebook group called Mark of the Maker, or on our Instagram at Mark of the Maker. Last but not least, the ultra cool and haunting background music we use for the show is a piece called Noir Guitar by Stevie's Amp Shack found at the Free Music Archive and licensed under Creative Commons CC BY 4.0. Thanks for listening. <laughs>